This is the oldest surviving king tiger in the world. It was just the second one off the production line. And today we call it King Tiger V2, as seen on its maker's plate. But this isn't any king tiger. It's unique. It's the only survivor with this particular type of turret. Now this is sometimes known as the Porsche turret. But why? And why did they feel the need to change the turret on later models? As the Tank Museum begins a mammoth £1 million project to bring King Tiger V2 back into running condition, we'll examine its unique history and examine the challenges we're going to face in putting it all back together. And stick around for news of a brand new workshop YouTube channel from the Tank Museum. Let's get this out of the way right now. Porsche did not design or build any part of the King Tiger, including this turret. In fact, the tank was designed and built by Henschel, and the turret was designed and built by Krupp, the same companies that had built the Tiger I. Which begs the question, why would anyone think that Porsche had anything to do with it? Well, it does look as though the tank museum might have been part of the problem. In this guidebook from 1983, a caption reads, Early models like the museum's exhibit and the abandoned tank shown here were equipped with a Porsche designed turret. Well, that's awkward. Sorry about that. How did we get that so wrong? Who knows? But it's not true to say that Porsche wasn't involved in the King Tiger story at all. And that is probably where the confusion arose. Let's find out how. One luxury car manufacturer won't be too keen for us to dwell on this, but its founder, Ferdinand Porsche, was a card-carrying Nazi. And being a chum of Hitler's, with the equivalent of a brigadier's rank in the SS, it seems he was an enthusiastic one at that. Being one of Hitler's mates was good for business, and he did well out of the need for military equipment. If you've watched any of our videos on Tiger One, I'm sure you're already familiar with Porsche's failed chassis design for it, known as the VK4501P. This, of course, lost out to a design from Henschel uh, in what was really a competition to build a tank that could mount the 88mm KWK36 L56 gun in a Krupp turret. This, of course, became Tiger One. Porsche had designed the first petrol electric drive for cars and he'd become obsessed with putting them into tanks. But this was to be his downfall as a tank designer because they were unreliable and overcomplicated. In spite of this, he was so confident in winning the competition, an order had been placed for 100. But when they were delivered, they weren't needed. The 91 were fitted with a more powerful 88mm Pac-43 L71 anti-tank gun and converted to use as a heavy tank destroyer, known as the Ferdinand, and later the Elephant. Undeterred, and with Wehrmacht looking to replace Tiger I with a tank that could mount this gun in a traversable turret, Porsche thought he'd have another go. This gave rise to the VK4502P, which would never make it off the drawing board. But you can see it modelled in the video game World of Tanks. Porsche's design, or rather designs, for two variants, Type 180 and Type 181, involved two turret placements, Vaughan or forward and Hinton or rear, plus five different combinations of petrol or diesel engines and electric or hydraulic drives. In the end, and rather like his Tiger One design, the whole thing was far too complicated and didn't get as far as the prototype stage. Although three partly built hulls seem to have been produced for testing. As we've said, petrol electric particularly was something of an obsession with Dr. Porsche and it does have advantages. There's no need for a gearbox or drive shaft as the electric motors drive each track independently, which leads to better control of track speed and torque and also a lower noise signature. Against this, weight and complexity increase and reliability drops, especially in combat conditions. Now, bearing in mind all that, plus massive problems at the development stage, the project was scrapped in November 1942. Even before the design had been accepted, though, an order was placed with Krupp 
for 100 VK4502P turrets, and 50 had been produced. And this is one of them. And that's why this has been known as the Porsche turret, and why some have referred to this as the Porsche King Tiger. So how did it end up here on this tank? But before we find out, if you're enjoying this video, please give us a like. It helps to get our videos out to a wider audience. And if you'd like to support the Tank Museum and help us get this vehicle into running condition, please stick around to the end or follow the link below. Thank you very much. Fortunately for Krupp, they would find a new customer in Porsche's competitor, Henschel. Eager to meet the requirements for a new heavy tank, they've begun to evolve their original Tiger design with the VK4502H. This was basically a Tiger 1 with sloped front and sides, with the armour thickness increased from 100 to 150 millimetres on the glassy and 80 to 100 millimetres on the sides. It also included a new engine, the Maybach HL230 and the Oldvar B transmission, both intended for the MAN designed Panther II. The result was VK4503H. The hull alone was a metre longer than Tiger I, and overall, including the gun, it was two metres longer. It was also at 68 tonnes, 14 tonnes heavier than Tiger I, and 20 tonnes heavier than Panther. The German army was keen to get hold of its new tanks, and partly because of this, and also partly to avoid waste, it was decided to use the turret that was intended for the Porsche design on the new Henschel hull. The only major change was that the electrically powered turret traverse intended for the Porsche tank would need to be switched for a hydraulic version. In October 1943, with design work still in progress, a contract was issued by Waffenprofenamt 6, the Armour Commissioning Office, to Henschel for the production of the new Tiger II. This would begin with three prototypes, Versuchsfahrgesteller 1, 2 and 3, V1, V2 and V3. On October the 20th, Hitler saw a wooden mock-up of the tank and was impatient to see the finished vehicle. As a result, V1 was transported to Wolfschanze at Rustenburg in East Prussia for a demonstration on December the 16th, 1943. V2 and V3 were completed at Henschel's Castle Works by the end of December that year. V1, a Flusseisenbahner or mild steel prototype without any of the usual external fittings, was then returned to the Kummersdorf Proving Ground outside Berlin. And V3 was used as an engine test rig by Maybach at their Friedrichshafen Works. The fate of both is uncertain, but they were most likely either scrapped or destroyed. Fortunately for us, this vehicle, V2, was retained by Henschel at Panzerfuchtstation 96, their specialised testing ground at Haustenbeck near Senna. The area was overrun by US troops in May 1945, but then passed into British control. And that's where V2, along with other vehicles, were found. A visit to Haustenbeck by representatives of the British Ministry of Supply in August 1945 records V2 as being in good running order and complete with its deep wading and gas proofing test kit. Along with other vehicles, it was brought back to the UK for evaluation in January 1946, eventually arriving at the RAC Tank Museum in 1952. But unfortunately, as we'll see, V2 did not arrive at Bovington in the same complete condition that it left Germany. Various organisations were involved in the evaluation once it was taken to England, and various parts went astray, not least the gearbox. This Tiger has also had a variety of paint schemes, even during its time in the museum. Arriving in weather-beaten but original Dunkelgelb, dark yellow, it was then painted green, and then, which quite a few past visitors to the museum will remember, given an unconvincing cam scheme. In 2017, for display in the Tiger Collection exhibition, it was returned to a more authentic Dunkelgelb, as it now is. In 2019, it went on tour, visiting the National Militaire Museum in the Netherlands, the Swedish Arsenalen Museum, and the Parola Armour Museum in Finland, finally arriving back at the Tank Museum in 2024, where the team have been evaluating its condition to assess if some kind of restoration would be possible. We think it is. So let's take a closer look.
As a prototype, King Tiger V2 has quite a number of differences that mark it out from the production model. The turret is an obvious one. Now, we've talked about the origins of the turret. What we haven't discussed is why they found it necessary to change the design. Now, the idea behind the design was that this curved surface would reduce the area likely to be hit by an incoming round. But in fact, what it did was to create a massive shot trap down here, and that would deflect around down into the hull of the tank. And that was proved the first time these things were in action in 1944. The other thing about this turret is it was very difficult to produce. Not only is the shape complex, and it incorporates uh, a bulge here for the commander's cupola, but the major components, and that includes this very sharply curved frontal plate, are forged from flat pieces of rolled homogenous armour. That is to say, they're heat forged into shape, not moulded. Producing this complicated shape by forging resulted in a high proportion of components cracking, and Krupp wanted to remake them. But in something that sounds totally foreign to the usual precision we associate with German tank building, they were just told to fill the cracks with weld and retemper the piece. Of the 100 ordered, only 50 were produced, and the design would be replaced during production by the flat-fronted Serienturm type turret. Uh, that removed the problem with the shot trap, and it was easier to produce. This gun, the 88mm KWK 43 L71, is an enormously powerful weapon. It was capable of putting a round through the frontal armour of a Sherman or a T-34 at a range of up to 3,000 metres. Couple that with the excellent lights optics in the Termsil Fernrohr 9D weapon sight, uh, much the same as fitted to Tiger 1, and this is a formidable weapon. Unfortunately, both the gun sight and even the weapon mount disappeared a long time ago, and even the gun itself has had a bit of an eventful history. When V2 first appeared at the museum in 1952, along with the Young Tiger and a number of other ex-evaluation vehicles, the tank had no gun and looked very sorry for itself. The gun, or a gun, however, had appeared by the time of royal visit in 1956. The question is, is it the right gun? For many years, an information panel in the museum told visitors that this gun was of a later type. But it seems that might not be true. To begin with, it's of the earlier monoblock construction. That is a single piece barrel forging. And another difference, something equally big and obvious, no zimmerit. As this was a prototype and almost certainly would never see combat, there wasn't a lot of point in applying anti-magnetic paste. Coming round to the rear, the exhausts. Now, obviously only one survives. Uh, but these are straight rather than curved like the production model, and they have these flanges. Those were designed for gas proofing experiments. Now, gas proofing uh, was carried out at Haustenbeck in the Gashalle, which was a tank sized gas chamber. Uh, and overpressure inside the tank was built up through a Draeger filter system. Now, the engine had to be kept running. So the flanges are designed to take away the exhaust gases during the course of the experiment. And the presence of these, this chimes in with the Ministry of Supplies observations. The mud guards on the prototypes and a few of the earliest production models were flat, similar to the Tiger 1 design, rather than curved, as were the ones fitted to the main production run. Coming to the front, the towing eyes on the production tanks were modified to take a C-clip. Another indicator up here on the back deck is this aperture here. Now, it's lost its armoured uh, cover, unfortunately, but what that is, is a fitting for a nine metre schnorkel tube. These are found on the prototypes, the very limited number of the production models, but it marks this tank out as a very early Tiger in the sequence. If we get inside and have a look at the gun, the production code on the breech and we are obliged to Melcher Stickelorum for this and other detail, is R18FL184AMP. AMP is the manufacturer code for Dortmunder Hürde Huttenverein, who produced all the KWK 43 gun barrel tubes, 
but the important bit is R18. What that means is that this gun is one of a batch of 33, which was accepted before December 1943. That makes it a very early KWK-43. And it's odds on, this is the original gun for this tank. Up on top of the turret, you start to realise what was lost during that evaluation phase back in the late 1940s. Almost all the hatches are missing, as is the commander's cupola. There's also one distinctive feature, this step. Now what this is all about is the front and rear plates are 25mm thick. This central plate is 40mm, hence a 15mm step. Uh, on the production model, of course, the whole top of the turret was 40mm. As you can see, the turret was fairly well stripped out during evaluation, even down to the disappearance of the original gun mount. For many years, the gun, while the tank was on display, was propped up on balks of timber, although it now sits, rather more securely, in this steel-fabricated temporary mount. The loader's hatch is one of the few hatches to survive, along with the extractor fan, incredibly ineffective by all accounts, and the Nahvertigungswaffe, a close support mortar which could either fire grenades or smoke. Looking back into the bustle, the ready racks at the back of the turret have partly been removed. Now, having ammunition stowage here must have been a major boon for the loader, as the very long and heavy rounds could be slid forward into the breech quite easily. The downside of this was discovered when Tiger II entered service on the Eastern Front. Soviet tank crews discovered that a hit on the rear of the turret here would cause a catastrophic ammunition explosion. Ammunition stowage was rapidly moved down into the hull. Down in the hull itself, some of the floor plates remain, and below that, you can see the lateral torsion bar suspension. The driver's handbrake and pedals survive, although most of the transmission has gone, including the double differential steering gear. Looking back into the engine compartment, the Maybach HL230 engine itself was still there when the Tiger came to the museum, but it was removed in the late 1980s as part of the restoration of Tiger 131. There will be many fascinating challenges ahead as we undertake a mammoth project to bring King Tiger V2 back to life. This will be the most ambitious project we have ever undertaken, and it will take an estimated four years to complete. The project will be led by our workshop team, supported by a range of carefully selected partners from across Europe. We'll use the project as a springboard for further research, to develop new skills and train the next generation of heritage engineers, using external experts to guide us where necessary. And we'll share our journey with you online, even the bits that don't go to plan. And you'll be able to follow this and many other projects on our new YouTube channel, the Tank Museum Workshops. The link is in the description. So head across now to subscribe and click the notification bell. Finally, if you'd like to help us bring King Tiger V2 back to life, please follow this link. We'd very much appreciate your help in reaching what is a very substantial fundraising target. Thank you for watching.